Greetings to all of you watching the fourth Layer 8 conference from so many places around the world. It is a great pleasure being part of this year's event and with a big thank you going out to the organizers and the people that made it possible. It is even more exciting for me as I have the opportunity to present briefly an idea, something that I have been working in the back of my head for so many years now. And I have never attempted to put it into a presentable format until today. I will share at the end of the presentation further reading resources for those interested, and of course the GitHub page, where you can find more identifiers compared to the sample in this presentation. My name is Dr. Gregorios Fragos, but I do tend to prefer Greg. Due to the chosen length of my session today, I hope it's enough to give you the general idea, pick your interest, hopefully keeps you interested throughout the session and leave you with enough time and hunger to watch all the amazing talks scheduled for today. I lived in the UK for almost 20 years where I studied research and engaged in cybersecurity at so many fronts. Conscious of time, there is no need to take you through my short bio at the moment, but give you a little backstory to understand the origins of this talk. You see, when I was doing my master's and my PhD, my university along with the information security research group, which I was part of, was also the first and only one at the time being that had a real digital forensics lab. It was built to serve both academic work and helping police investigations related to computer crime. Just FYI, we were the first who published the well-known disk study of publicly purchased second-hand hard drives and created specialized trainings for the police on how to identify and seize evidence in crime scenes that can potentially contain digital evidence or even lead to further evidence. During a case, we ended up with a number of audio files. Even though we had other digital evidence to recover, data carve and analyze, it stuck to my head at that time that it would be really cool to be able to come to certain conclusions when working with audio files. Imagine something similar to linguistic forensics, but more of a, where is someone from and in that case? By only listening to that person, keep in mind, um, the idea was very unstructured and vague at that time. As I was exposed to so many students from all over the world, it started becoming something like a personal bet to listen, observe, and try to identify where is someone from, especially those who were speaking very good English. I didn't want to base it on someone's accent. And that is the big differentiator in the presentation you are currently watching. I wanted to identify, if possible, if certain words, phrases, the way that we speak, the way that we communicate, can act as a tell. Like someone has a tell when playing poker or when specific hand gestures are used by certain nationalities when speaking. Words or phrases that have a tongue a peculiarity to give away more information, more intelligence, if you may, about the person talking. At the time being, the concept was completely from an academic perspective. In my mind, something like that could potentially allow a profiler, a social engineer, an investigator to narrow down the background of the individual in question. Eventually, under certain circumstances, could be used in different ways that later on it became apparent that it is also possible to use in both OSINT and OPSEC, for example. But as you can imagine, that is something for a future presentation. As I dived into this journey of making observations, as it was a completely side project at the back of my head, I started over the years reading different books, publications and textbooks about language in general. I was trying to match and explain somehow similarities and patterns. That notion is reflected in speech spectrums, in which roughly translates as the reason why there are certain difficulties in saying, pronouncing, if you may, certain vowels and consonants in languages other than our mother tongue. In our example here, you can see four different meanings of exactly the same word depending only on the tone used, which to the untrained ear, obviously, all of them would be assumed to be the same word. As you can see, there are four different 
pieces of the word ma. I do find this very fascinating. I find it very more fascinating that Cantonese can spread across six different tones, with some claiming that it can be stretched to nine, but most researchers seems to agree at six. All that tang and peculiarity is imprinted with our mother tongue. Friends, environment, the languages used with family adds to this imprint. And unconsciously, we tend to say things by emphasizing differently, having our distinctive speech spectrum. A few simple well-known examples between American English and the Queen's English are tomato, tomato, advertisement, advertisement, what, what, aluminum, aluminum, and my favorite one, it is SQL, not SQL. You can fight me afterwards on this. Hope that introduction was useful enough to set the scene. Without further ado, here's some example of words that act as identifiers and their respective reasons. Let's start with Cyprus as an honorary mention as it was one of my first observations and confirmed in many different ways. Please note that most Cypriots, their accent in English tends to be exceptional. Asking someone to read the expression, I have great culture, is a highly revealing tell for Cypriots. Even though the gria in great sound is distinctive enough to identify the tell that we're looking for. The word culture is pronounced as culture every time. I actually had a unique opportunity to cross verify this with a UK barrister, first generation born in the UK. For someone to be a barrister, their English is going to be near perfect to the Queen's English. The second tell is the expression, what are you looking at? Obviously, I cannot do it perfectly the way that you would hear it from a Cypriot, but a question that ends with the word at, that comes right after a verb ending with ing, um, is very distinctive. Similarly, the what word is, tends to have a higher emphasis on the at part, but not that easy to identify by itself in different combinations of sentences. Let's start with a fun fact about Australian English. I believe you recognize this four letter music band and most of you, if we had the opportunity to be in a live setup and have a show of hands, you would agree with me that this is ACDC. To your surprise, at least to those who are not aware of this, for an Australian, it is straight obvious that this says Akadaka. I know, it's different. A second tell is the expression tastes like butter, where the fluctuation speech spectrum from the mother tongue in this case, involuntary puts extra emphasis to the I and the ba sound in the butter. Conscious of time, I'm giving you just the highlights of the different identifiers. I really wish we were in person to go through this in a more detail. It would be a lot of fun to study these identifiers. So let's move on to Hindi. Again, forget accent. I know it is difficult to suddenly make that distinction. This was difficult identifier and it was tested extensively at different parts of the world. The word correct is by far the biggest tell when said, it is always, it always sounds like correct. A wide A followed by a short, sudden kt sound. Um, a friend of mine, he's an American Indian, second generation. He speaks perfect English. That's the only word that actually betrays if you were only to hear him speaking and not if you were to hear him on the phone that he has some Indian background. Moving on to a very special example. Apparently, this word makes a huge difference between the way it is pronounced based on the person's background and can even help distinguish between spoken Deutsch from Germany, especially the Berlin area, compared to Dutch speaking Deutsch in the Netherlands. I know it can get a little bit confusing. A shout out to Chris Kubeka for helping me identifying this word. 
it is very difficult for me to say it. And it's, uh, I don't want even to attempt to say it, but this is a great, great example as far as I know in the test that we've done. Until now, we haven't seen an example that is based on malapropism. An individual with Arabic as their mother tongue from the region of Palestine tends to read and pronounce Bruce Lee in the heat of a conversation as Abu Rasi. They say it wrong. Now, how you end up incorporating this identifier in your conversations, it is up to you and your imaginations, obviously. I chose a couple of examples that are based on Arabic as the mother tongue, simply because even among Arabs and Arabic speakers, it tends to be very difficult to distinguish sometimes. And I saw it as a very interesting challenge in this case. For example, distinguishing between the extremely similar regional influences in the speed spectrum between Jordan and Palestine, Palestinians use and know how to pronounce the word Zalame, for example. That is a very interesting identifier and a shout out to Dina Nassar for helping identifying this word. We couldn't leave the French out of our brief example. I have actually included a number of words here, but the most interesting one, which can also lead you in funny, uncomfortable situations, I would say, is the word focus. As we need to keep this session PG, let's just mention that this word ends up with a more distinctive fa sound instead of fo. I believe this is where people do this wink, wink gesture, right? Anyhow, you see, this is why sign language is more clear in what you mean in this type of situations. And you couldn't be able to apply this model. Here's a fun fact for you before we move on. Every language travel at the speed of sound. Sign language travels at the speed of light. I kept Greek for last, despite the fact it would be interesting to spend more time to go through the Greek identifiers, which some of them can be seen in the slide. I wanted to cheer you up a bit before moving into closing the presentation. I'm sure most of you have heard of the comedian Zach Galichanakis. His last name can act as an identifier for the same reasons the word Yiros is very distinctive as an identifier. For those of you who are not familiar with Yiros, think of it as the almost national food in Greece. More specifically, pronouncing the distinctive G sound is a special identifier. So special that there is even a song about it. Jimmy Fallon and Luke Bryan did a whole sketch about this word. So for you to quickly enjoy. Is it Guaro, Gahiro, Euro or Warpsy? We can safely rule that last one out. How would you pronounce it then? Euro. It is Euro, it is Euro. Now I know it's Euro. The truth is so delicious to find. No more fear, oh, you're a hero. Cause now I know it's hero. I finally got some peace of mind. We finally got some peace of mind. It is hero, and it is even more delicious to actually try it. Closing this hopefully tasteful presentation, here is a GitHub link to look through the different identifiers I have listed. And some further reading I did in order to understand how to approach and organize the observations I was coming across. Maybe with some more contributions, trials and errors, we can come up in the future with a type of panphonic poem, similar to the voice synthesizer pangram in Mission Impossible movies that once one reads it, you can use it to make certain deductions and potentially use it in human intelligence gathering. Thank you all for your time and attentions and don't hesitate to reach out to me or drop me a line. I will be sharing the presentation file on my Twitter account, which includes an appendix about the famous cognitive test that uses simple sentences such as no ifs, ends, or buts. Test yourself on how many times you can repeatedly say this sentence out loud 
without making a mistake. Thank you all. Enjoy the rest of the conference.